Terrific. Why don't we get started? Um, I know we also have 50-plus uh, people online as well joining us, and this is the, uh, the reality now of hybrid events such as this, but I wanted to welcome personally everyone who's in the room today, as well as our guests who are online. My name is Joseph Wong, and I'm a professor here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, I also have the privilege of serving as the Vice President International for the University of Toronto, and it's in that position that I welcome all of you to the U of T, as well as bring greetings from the President and also just the Provost with whom I had uh, a meeting before I came over here. Uh, before we begin with the proceedings, I would like to uh, acknowledge, uh, first of all, the traditional territories of the Mississauga, of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee, Indigenous Peoples, on which the Dalalana School of Public Health now stands. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We would also like to pay our respects to all of our ancestors and to our present elders. It's my pleasure today to uh, offer some welcoming remarks and some introductory remarks uh, for our keynote speaker, Dr. Zofi Buta. And he'll be talking about addressing maternal and child health and sustainable development, the do's and don'ts of doing so equitably. Uh, Zofi is the 2022 John Dirks Gard Canada Gardner Global Health Award winner. He is the Robert Harding Chair in Global Child Health. He's the co-director of the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health. He's a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Nutritional Sciences, and Public Health. It's really a tremendous honor to be able to offer some introductory remarks uh, for this terrific event. Uh, Zulfi has had uh, an extraordinary influence on me as a scholar. I'm a political scientist and a comparative public policy scholar, and uh, Zofi may not know this because we've had a uh, few opportunities. We've had a few opportunities to interact personally over the last several years, but the, the specter of Zofi and knowing that he's at Sick Kids and at the Center for Global Child Health has always loomed large over my own research as someone who's also concerned with issues of global health. He has always placed a premium on measurement. Uh, an extraordinary empirical researcher uh, focused on not just conjecture and normative claims, but also deep and rich analysis of empirics. His concern is around equity. And I think this is really important when we unpack and we think about what equitable means. It really invokes notions of fairness, notions of justice, and this really then puts us in a place where it's not just simply a question of technocratic solutions to prevailing challenges, but he forces us to think in terms of our analysis, in terms of the work that we do, as I say, not just about the technocratic solutions that academics can uh, or are more than prepared to offer, but also to think about how we need to, in the name of equity, be redressing historical injustice. It's really an active act of redressing those wrongs that preceded uh, and proceeded to where we are today. And he encourages us to not only think about this in the very locales within which perhaps our research sites are or the communities within which we work, but it's always about at scale. And any paper that I've given or any talk that I've given or any opportunity I've had an opportunity to interact with Zulfi, he has always encouraged me, and I know that he's encouraged many in this room, to constantly think about this work at scale. And in many ways, the talk that he's about to deliver, I think, sets us up very nicely to not only talk about the Sustainable Development Goals and the SDG agenda as it is being lived today, but when I think about Zulfi's work, and what he represents, and the academic standards that he demands of all of us, I'm also thinking about the post-2030 world, and we haven't had a chance to chat about this. But we know that in many respects, a lot of the goals, a lot of the lofty goals of the SDGs are likely not to be reached by 2030. And so we ought to be thinking about what the post-2030 world entails. And herein, I think, lies an opportunity for those of us within the university community. When we think, or at least it strikes me, 
that when we think about the 2015 SDG agenda, of which we are now in the middle, this was a set of conversations that were brokered between governments. It was an intergovernmental agreement. The corporate sector got into the game the year later with the Global Compact. But it strikes me that universities, beyond our roles as advisors or PIs or authors of significant studies, we were not necessarily at the table. And as I look ahead to 2030, and indeed we'll start having those conversations around what the post-2030 world is going to look like probably in the next three or four years, that we ought to, as a university community, be at that table. That we offer insights in terms of what metrics matter most. That we actually provide theories about how we might actually achieve these goals, rather than having, if we're thinking about this in cartographical terms, rather than having a map in which we know where the destination is, but we don't really know what the terrain is that we need to traverse and that we need to wind, and wind our way around. In other words, how do we achieve those goals? That's the work of academics. That's the work of academic institutions. So when I think of the work that Zulfi does and the remarks he's about to offer, I think about the way in which we can do some stage setting as a university, as a university community, to, in a sense, demand that we be at that table, that we not only contribute our knowledge to decision makers who then speak on our behalf, but in fact, we're there to help set the agenda. I think there's an important set of contributions that the universities and the university sector and research can offer. Before we get into the talk, I do have a few housekeeping notes that I wanted to run through. We will try to address as many questions as possible at the end. If you're joining us online, you are welcome to add any comments or questions in the Q&A section, and I know that uh, Professor de Ruggiero will be monitoring that. For those of you who are in person, you're welcome to um, uh, stick around after the event to grab a snack, which I think I already did. I apology. uh, apologies in advance, but to mingle with the speakers and the guests. And if you have any questions about this webinar, please send them to globalhealth.dlsph at utoronto.ca. As I say, Professor Buta will be offering a keynote address, but we also have two remarkable guests who will form a panel and who will offer their own insights and reactions to what they hear from Zulfi. The first is Professor Erica de Ruggiero. She is an associate professor at the Dalana School of Public Health here at U of T. She's also the director for the Center for Global Health. She's the director of the Collaborative Specialization in Global Health. She's a close colleague of mine in the Global Reach Alliance. And she and her voice are leading a university-wide initiative around the SDGs. We also have the privilege and honor of hearing from Miriam Wade-Dreago, who is a PhD student in EPI. She's in the Collaborative Specialization in Global Health Program, and her research explores armed conflict in Mali and the impacts of conflict on reproductive maternal and child health. And through her work and her efforts, uh, she's really bringing to light our efforts and the needs and the health needs of conflict-afflicted women and children. She is also a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar, an extraordinary achievement uh, and a reflection of her um, academic uh, achievements to date and certainly for a very bright academic future. And with that, I now welcome Dr. Zofi Buta to offer his keynote address. Thank you. So, Thank you very much, Joe, for those extremely kind and uh, thoughtful comments. And <coughs> I'd encourage you to come tomorrow morning, if you can, to the symposium, where part of what I will cover in, in my 30 minutes would also be around what do we do beyond the SDGs. Because the SDGs are not only upon us, they've also been very rudely interrupted uh, over the last few years. So if I can have the slides up, if I may. Um, so what I hope to do, ladies and gentlemen, over the next 20 minutes or so, is to give you a very personal perspective on a topic that few people talk about uh, and was definitely not something on the radar screen when we began discussions on global maternal and child health in the year 2000. So what I hope to cover is, first of all, the question is why does this matter? And what were the lessons on equity that we imbibed towards the latter end of the Millennium Development Goals. I'll spend a little bit of time on measurement because equity measurement isn't a straightforward issue and there are a lot of new developments in terms of how we can do better than what we have done traditionally. Uh, 
Uh, I'll talk about strategies that have been used, some of those I've been personally involved in, on to try and see how you can bridge those gaps and those um, uh, inequities that we can see. And I will, towards the end, talk a little bit about the don'ts. What are we beginning to learn from the experience of some of these approaches over the last 10, 15 years that help us guide as to how to move forward, so the pitfalls? I don't think I'll have quite enough time to talk about the SDGs, but as I mentioned, the discussion has now moved beyond the SDGs because we have hardly got seven or eight years left to the targets of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So I'd encourage you to maybe potentially join us tomorrow morning at the symposium where I hope to speak about this. So the Millennium Development Goals were, were the first time that the world actually got together around global targets, aspirations, a vision for a better world than what we were living in. And although the goals were set in a relatively hurried, non-democratic process by just appointing committees and getting them to get together and pick some targets, they did pick targets at that time, in the year 1999, and I sat on two of those committees, that did represent some of the greatest global challenges that we face. So reducing child mortality from the figures that we thought we had at that time by two-thirds by the year 2015, and reducing maternal mortality by three quarters by the year 2015. Now every country was supposedly beginning with the target around where they were in 1990, but the world truly did not have exact measurement or figures as to where they were at that time. The most of these were guesstimates because a lot of the demographic and health surveys had only just begun to kick in in many countries. So this was just plucked out of thin air. But I'm glad it was plucked out because it did give the world a target. It did give us all an aspirational goal. And by the time the world woke up to it, by the year 27, 28, many people began to take it very seriously. And what happened over this period of time, certainly post 2000, was nothing less than remarkable. So if you look at where we ended up in 2015, we were able to reduce child mortality from a potential base figure of 12.7 million deaths in 1990, 10 million deaths in 2000, to less than 6 million deaths by 2015. And if you took the increase in global population into account, the world ostensibly met Millennium Development Goal 4 target collectively. And this was one of the major reasons why people said, well, you know, we've done so well, let's move on. Let's set ourselves an even higher target, a broader target in the Sustainable Development Goals. But it was very clear, even towards the end of the MDG period, that this progress, even though on aggregate was remarkable, it was unequal. And if you look at this global map in terms of which countries have achieved you will see that a lot of the MDG4 progress globally was driven by China, by large countries like Brazil, uh, some countries in Southeast Asia, and, and also parts of the Middle East. And this tells you that these cumulative figures or aggregate figures do sometimes mislead you in terms of who's being left behind. And no one picked this much better then the executive director of UNICEF, Tony Lake, who actually came from a very different background than public health. Tony Lake was a director of CIA. And when he took over the helm of affairs at UNICEF, within a month of his taking office, he came up with this very poignant observation. And when he was presented these data on how countries had made progress, he lashed on to the one thing that he was seeing across those data sets and made the statement that these global aggregate successes hide behind the tremendous moral and ethical failures. And he's talking about people who had been left behind on the basis of poverty, on the basis of geography, on the basis of ethnicity, marginalized populations. And a lot of people don't quite understand what he was alluding to. And to understand that, I'll show you this cartoon that I've shown many times before, which is really the comparison 
of how countries progressed in reducing child mortality with the additional measurement of whether or not they did this with a reduction in inequality in mortality figures between their relatively well-off and otherwise, or an increase in inequity. So if you see on the x-axis, there are these countries that have done very well. And some of them have actually seen also a reduction in inequality over this period of time. But look at this huge clustering of countries where although they met their child mortality reduction targets, they actually saw an increase in inequality within their own geographies. Now, how does that happen? Now, that happens when you have programs and policies that generally reach the relatively well-off first, either on the basis of geographic advantage, those who live in big cities, those who are educated, those who are relatively rich and have access, or those who have vehicles and can get to facilities. So just like how a country's GDP per capita income on average can be driven by just the top 5% of the super billionaires in that country, the aggregate child mortality reduction can be driven by the relatively well-off. And that principle was extremely important in recognizing towards the end of the MDGs that we had missed a big issue in not only building our targets, but building the measurement issues around those targets. Now, we in the countdown for 2015 and 2030, an organization that I was fortunate to chair for about 15 years, we caught on that very early. And we came up with a number of ways of measuring these disparities. So how do we do this? So one of the earlier ways in which we presented inequities between countries and uh, across various indicators was through these Manhattan plots. So each one of these dots in these uh, bars are a country. And as you can see across the continuum of coverage for many interventions in women and child health, there are many countries who, although may have reached a reasonably um, um, high median rate of coverage, but you can see the disparity out there even for things like immunizations. And what we found was that these disparities were greatest when you were not dealing with vertical programs. Immunization is a vertical program. But where you were dealing with functional health systems and facilities that need to function 24-7, you found that many countries were far, far behind others. So this was one principle, one concept of showing disparities. Another way of doing that was to look at not just one indicator, but a composite in set of indicators. And we came up with the concept of composite coverage indicators. This was initially eight, then it was expanded to 11, then brought back to a, a number that you see at the bottom. And this looks at a range of service deliveries through both outreach workers, fixed health outposts, as well as vertical programs. And you show that through heat maps that the greater the composite coverage index, you find that it covers a wide span of interventions that go across reproductive health to child health, where these countries not only do well for the set of indicators, but they do well across services. So it's a mindset of equitable service delivery that often drives um, uh, health services and encourages it to reach people who are not being reached. Another way of measuring that, that people very commonly use, is to look at asset indices. You can't go and ask populations and people for how much they make, and sometimes money uh, does not really measure poverty. Uh, poverty is more than income, but assets was one way of looking at what deprivation meant for different people. So these asset indices across demographic and health surveys were used as a measure of looking at how did certain indicators pan out between the rich and the poor. And the way we, sh we showed that initially was through comparison of quintiles, asset quintiles. And as you can see on this graph, if you take child mortality here at the bottom, uh, the poorest have fairly high child mortality, usually two to two and a half times that which you see amongst the relatively rich in a given population. 
Interestingly, we found very early on that although that was true for child mortality in aggregate, when you came to something like newborn mortality, that difference was minuscule. Now, what did that tell us at a very early stage that even though child services were available in many countries, for newborn care, which required a very different set of interventions and an integration of maternal and newborn care around the period of childbirth, very few countries were doing very well. And that's why newborn mortality lagged so much behind child mortality in many places. Then we got a bit smarter and said, well, why don't we do it even better? Instead of quintiles, let's measure deciles. And that way we'll be able to tell if there are the ultra poor who are not captured with just looking at the bottom quintile, the bottom 25%. And as you can see, in some countries, this does capture the ultra poor. In others, it does not. But these measurements using asset quintiles or socioeconomic gradients don't quite capture many policy relevant things that we wanted to capture. One of those was, how do you disaggregate the poor who are living in urban populations from those who are living in rural populations? So double disaggregation in looking at the poor who live in urban slums became a big challenge. And although we tried to do this in some ways, we could never convince policymakers that this was something that they could act upon. So in came additional methodologies, experimented by people who had statistical expertise to look at geospatial clustering of mortality. And, and uh, Marshall Burke and Iran Ben David, colleagues of mine at Stanford, looked at a lot of this in the context of Africa. And they were able to show that not only these child mortality hotspots cluster, they frequently crossed borders, administrative borders, sovereign borders. Why? Because the drivers and determinants of mortality did not need passports. So if the three main drivers for this were conflict, climate change, and malaria, none of those required any country's nationality to just stop at, stop at the border. So if you look at this geospatial mapping by five and five, five by five kilometers, it makes it very clear that we need to look at some of this mortality clustering beyond national boundaries and, and therefore have regional planning for some interventions around this. My friend Seth Berkeley at uh, Gavi, when I joined the board, made a very poignant remark which I lashed on, and a lot of our work on the, in the immunization sphere focused on how we could use some of this to learn where were people who were not covered. So he made the observation that, you know, with general average coverage of immunizations running around 80%, we knew that every fifth child was not covered. But the problem was that that fifth child is not necessarily standing next to the fourth. So in terms of identifying who those children are who are not being covered by immunizations or services, you needed to be smarter than just picking up these aggregate figures and, and, and uh, putting them in advocacy terms. And that's how localization and targeting to identify some of these inequities and gaps in service delivery and coverage came about. I'll give you one example from my own work. These are hotspots of children who are unimmunized, who have zero dose of any vaccine in, in a high-risk area of Karachi. And you can see very clearly that they cluster around certain areas. Now, I happen to know that they cluster around here because it's not just immunization deprivation. It's deprivation of services, period, because the people who live here are different from people who live elsewhere in this union council. They're different, not because they're just poor. They're different because they're socially and ethnically marginalized. And that brought in the concept that we have not been able to follow up so far on using ethnicity, for example, in many places, or indigenous populations in many places, as a means of looking at who is covered and not. Now, this ethnoplot um, made by Cesar Victoria um, at our request is a very important way of looking at newborn mortality. And I want you to see the red circles across this range of countries. These red circles are the dominant ethnic group 
in that country. And across the board, in most countries, the dominant ethnic group has the lowest neonatal mortality rate. But you see the spread of the other ethnicities, and you will find that many of them have five, six, four-folds higher neonatal mortality. Now, this has been one frustration in global health, that it has been very difficult to convince government to present own or act upon data on the basis of ethnicity. But moving forwards, particularly SDGs and beyond, I think we need to open up to other drivers that hide behind them deprivations that are not just money, that are not just access, but they have to do with social capital or lack of social capital, influence, and political power. So what do we do? So a lot of effort in the last decade or two has been around looking at strategies to reach these poorest of the poor. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So outreach services in community settings through community health workers. Um, I've done probably the largest number of cluster randomized trials of using this approach at scale it, in effectiveness setting. And the evidence around this on impacting child mortality, newborn mortality is absolutely strong and generally in the right direction. So they have, usually have an impact. You can argue how much. In effectiveness settings, it's not as high as 25%. It's generally lower. But I would take, at population level, 15% reduction in neonatal mortality any time. And similarly, if you look at maternal outcomes, 20 25% reduction in maternal morbidity. The other set of interventions that people have added on top of these community health workers is working directly with recipients, with women in particular. Because some of these issues of gender disparity do require empowering women through strategies that have to do with engagement, that have to do with reducing the sense of marginalization, and also encouraging them to perhaps develop much more resilience in the wake of poverty and deprivation. So women's group. Tony Costello's group has probably done the largest number of cluster randomized trials on this in South Asia and Africa. And just getting women together through this positive deviant self-help process makes a lot of difference. And the evidence around its impact on newborn mortality is pretty strong, generally up to about 20% reduction. And if you look at the direction of effect, which, which our group was able to analyze, it looks a lot of that is through also improved care seeking. Nothing magic happens at home for maternal and newborn mortality alone, unless it's also through access within the health services. But what happens when you combine this? Can you combine community strategies of empowerment, engagement with communities, especially women, and also functional health workers who can then reach those communities and provide services without their having to travel 100 kilometers to a district hospital? Now, there are a number of examples of this, and I'll, I'll go through some of them tomorrow. But I wanted to show you how the eye does not see what the mind does not know. And examples of learning ourselves when we began our work in Karachi in the high-risk, insecure districts of looking at integration of community mobilization and immunizations through community health workers. So this is a six-year experience um, uh, at scale. So we're looking at close to around 4 million population in, in, in the highest risk districts of Karachi. And in the first phase, when we looked at the impact of these services on the subgroup that we were most interested in is, were we able to shift the full, full immunization rates in this population? You will notice at the bottom here that we were able to see a slight change in the overall coverage, but not any impact on the gap, the equity gap between the richest and the poorest quintile. I'm summarizing this in a relatively simple way. And that encouraged us to go back and see what were we missing in terms of community mobilization. And two years later, you begin to see that there is a shift, both in terms of increased coverage, but also a reduction in the gap. And in the final year, when we had got our act together, and the community had also developed a bit more confidence in what we were trying to do, you can see how it impacted on reducing the equity gap between the rich and the poor within these communities. This is not small. This is, as I said, four or four and a half million population. 
And this is one of the first demonstrations that through this combination of approaches of community mobilization, engagement, and health outreach workers, you can actually reduce the equity gap even in urban settings, which people think is very challenging. So these are urban slums of, of Karachi where this could be done. The final thing that I want to talk about in terms of strategies is what people, and particularly people from schools such as this, are extremely interested in is poverty alleviation strategies, social safety nets. So cash transfers, whether they are conditional or unconditional, and one of the most remarkable examples of the success of a conditional cash transfer was the GSY scheme in India. The pregnancy-related conditional cash support to encourage people to deliver in facilities where you got a bit of money every time you climbed up the referral ladder. I was one of the people who reviewed this project at the time when the bank developed this, Asian Development Bank, and I said, you know, this can't succeed. I mean, all of our experience in these community settings is you can't pay these people to go to hospitals. And yet, this program was launched, and I was proven wrong, because in a remarkably short period of time, you could begin to see that how in some of the most difficult states, the referral patterns and women delivering in facilities changed. Not only did it change in numeric terms, but it also began to have an impact in terms of outcome. This one study by Steve Lim from IHME was one of the earlier ones that showed you through some statistical jugglery at that time that there may have been an impact on mortality. But be that as it may, even though it may not have impacted mortality as people think, it certainly encouraged poor people to go. So we know that this program has reached the poorest of the poor and it has led to a change in terms of uh, how facility deliveries in India, a big country, changed forever. Even if you took JSY away today, people will not go back to traditional birth attendance because once they go the pathway and the ladder of development, they stay where they are. As I close, I'd like to close with three thoughts on pitfalls. Where are things that we should not be complacent about in the strategies that we have currently in place for addressing inequities? And I'm gonna talk about three things quickly. Firstly, these community health workers are great. They have been a major, major power driver in terms of reducing inequities in the last 20 years. But they're not the panacea for everything. They do have a glass ceiling in terms of their technical capacities, but more important than not is a fundamental ethical question that I ask myself, particularly from the geography where I come from. So I want to show that to you by just two data slides. So this is the slide of the growth of health professionals in Pakistan over a period of time. And as you can see, there are two lines here which have taken off rocket, like a rocket with the growth of private medical schools, the growth of doctors, number of doctors just skyrocketed. So has the growth of lady health workers, these community health workers. They're now over 110,000. They cover about 70% or more of the rural population. But look at what's happened to midwives. That line is relatively flat. And you could have done a lot more with nurses. But the reason why the government took its foot off the pedal there was because they thought they had done what they needed to do for these poor populations. In 1994, the late Benazir Bhutto launched the Community Health Workers Program, the Lady Health Workers Program. We are sitting in 2022, almost three decades on. And what has developed over this period of time is a tiered health system in Pakistan where if you're rich and you live in a big city, you have access to a physician, you have access to an obstetrician, a nurse, or a midwife. But if you're poor and you live in a rural area, then your want in life is a community health worker. So this tier one or tier two health system is something that we should avoid absolutely in our quest for short-term solutions. The second big point that I'd like to drive home is that you know, just throwing money at a problem without focusing on targeting doesn't necessarily help. But many people, particularly policymakers, believe that. Believe in the trickle-down effect. And we looked at that through the lens of looking at how stunting reduces in countries. So these are the top five examples from our work on stunting exemplars. And Emily Keats is here. She led that work from my center here. Um, 
where we looked at these best examples, how these countries had done in terms of reducing stunting rates despite economic disadvantage. And they all did reasonably well. Rates of change, as you can see here, were three, five, three to five percent per annum. But if you look at how they got there, while two of the countries, as these best exemplars, did so with a reduction in inequity in Peru and Kyrgyz Republic, where there was a pro-poor program, the other three exemplars here actually saw an increase in inequity over a period of time because there wasn't targeting. There wasn't sufficient targeting. Now, you could argue that had they known better, they might have been able to do even better than what they, their policymakers did in this period of time. And the last example I want to show you is, again, back to, and this is hot off the press, actually. This was just published last week. This is the review of the health insurance program in the northern province of Pakistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. It's a phenomenal program, a, a, a very innovative program of giving every family money uh, for catastrophic health expenditures and for unmet needs for surgery, for procedures, et cetera. And it's got a reasonable amount of money behind it. So I looked at these data. They were published last week. And what the data don't tell you is that what's happened in this process, why? Because it targets both the private sector and the public sector, that over the first two years of the experience of this health insurance card program, these 11 categories have virtually swallowed 83% of the budget. And 90% of the service has been in private care facilities at the cost of public sector facilities. So when you launch these programs, you have to have a very clear equity focus on reaching the maximum number of people at the lowest cost. So I, I trained in the United Kingdom. In the NHS, you have national health insurance like we do in Canada. But in the UK, if you went to a physician in Harley Street, you paid out of your own pocket. The NHS would not cover it. <laughs> in Canada, we don't even have a private sector. So even if I wanted to access private care, I can't. So these parameters need to be put in place in low and middle income countries as you develop these programs at scale. And as you go to Pakistan next week and help the government of Punjab think its, think its NCD strategies, in non-communicable diseases, the vast majority of that work will be in the hands of the private sector at the moment because the public sector is so far behind. So ladies and gentlemen, as I close, the sustainable development goals are here. And to some extent, uh, we are not going to reach them. They are beyond aspiration now. The, the, these goals were set at a time when the world was a very different place. And I think with the economic crisis, the conflicts, the uh, COVID-related uh, depreciation, we need to look at these SDGs as a mechanism, as a platform for testing hypotheses and for moving forward with strategies uh, that will help us achieve our health targets. And I present to you that in my opinion, the most important SDG goal that will help the goal three of health is actually goal 10, which is reducing inequalities and improving gender equity between nations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Zufi, or Dr. Bhutta. <laughs> You're a really tough act to follow. So um, what I'm going to do in the next five to 10 minutes, and then I'll turn things over to Miriam, um, is just to offer a few comments based on your presentation, um, but also to reflect a little bit on my own scholarship, including work I've been doing on evaluating the uptake of sustainable development goals in high-income countries like ours, because as we all know, the SDGs did provide that opportunity for an accountability mechanism across all countries, whereas the MDGs disproportionately put the impact on low- and middle-income countries unfairly. So as you really clearly outlined, you know, the overarching SDG agenda is, I think, a global framework for action for people, the planet, and, and for partnership. But we really have to start looking beyond for all the reasons you've already outlined. 
I did want to highlight that while they were an improvement on the MDGs, there are many um, existing problems with them that really need to be called out. Um, I'm only going to highlight a few. One is that they are remarkably silent on the need to tackle racism. Uh, secondly, there are many inherent tensions and trade-offs within and across goals, which inevitably is um, not a surprise, but just to reflect on my own scholarship in the area of decent work. Um, interestingly, the ILO, or the International Labor Organization, was very pleased with themselves because they actually got a goal <laughs> on, the, on the placemat. Um, but decent work is actually um, uh, coupled with inclusive growth, but is inclusive really compatible um, or that notion of it? And then finally, gender equality, again, is really an important goal, but it's very much framed in non-binary terms. And so I think there are already major problems with them as they exist, and we need to really interrogate that. What I wanted to do is to pick up on two conceptual issues that you raised, um, Zufi. One was, of course, equity, and the other was scale. And then I'll share just a few findings to close on the extent of uptake and scaling of the SDG agenda in Canada, just building on some of my own work. So Joe actually started to talk a little bit about this, but I just wanted to extend this thought around equity. And as we know, equity um, has many definitions, but I think as your the evolution of the measurement of equity and in inequity is nicely illustrated from your slides, Many of our definitions and the way in which we conceptualize equity and also how we measure it still remain inadequate in providing normative guidance for policymakers and practitioners. Um, and so I would ask a number of questions that I think are important to consider that we perhaps don't ask enough. How is an inequity to be redressed is much more of a descriptive account of equity versus how it ought to be redressed, which is more normative. And the latter invokes many values and different ethical principles that aren't necessarily shared and actually need to be negotiated and are very much embedded in the way in which interventions, be it policies and programs, are actually designed and therefore implemented and, in fact, impact on how we evaluate those interventions. So, for example, Will we decide on the basis of a utility, which focuses on all affected by a potential action, like a vaccine distribution strategy? Will we weigh the social costs and benefits looking for the action that provides the greatest net benefits, which is sort of more at the population level? And as you nicely argued, Zufi, we also need to marry that with more targeted approaches because at a population level can be quite blunt in terms of who is not reached. We can, of course, take a rights-based approach, and I highlight that because the MDGs were, again, insufficiently calling out not just human rights and the importance of that, and that's, of course, a concept very closely tied to equity. And we can also take a justice approach, um, which focuses on the fair um, distribution or redistribution, which is what's uh, mainly uh, needed, of the benefits and bur burdens. But that, I think, requires a number of moral principles to be upheld. And I want to relate it to a second point, which is how our interventions are actually designed. Um, because that actually impacts, and you made this point towards the end of your presentation, we have targeted universal, and increasingly we need to push for interventions that adhere to the principles of proportionate universalism. But that actually requires a very careful account of understanding the cumulative disadvantage that is facing different populations and different subpopulations. And often we lack information about the inputs, which is the interventions we're trying to measure the impact of and their equity effects. So I wanted to just raise a few of those points around equity. But the second point you raised um, briefly was at scale. And um, I wanted us to just you know, think a little bit about what do we mean by scale? I think there is a dominant imperative, which is not just shared by researchers, but funders, um, if you even look at some of the calls that they issue, that the dominant discourse is we should scale more, right? Or scale up or scale out. And, um, but we don't actually always know what the solutions are to very complex development, and including health problems. And this is clearly not the case. And many of our pre-existing solutions are too simplistic to effectively address complex social 
problems and the level of uncertainty is actually quite considerable. So I think we need to think a little bit more nuance. This is really a measurement question, but also a research question around scaling up, scaling out, scaling deep, and are we really scaling for impact? And what is being scaled is not always a discrete intervention, but it could be program components. And the more complex the intervention, um, the more difficult it is to really understand that. And that speaks to a point you also made, Zufi, around how many of these interventions are very much embedded in context, and we don't do a very good job of measuring context. So social, political, organizational, the institutional context in which health human resource decisions are made, just to pick up on your last example. And so I would argue that we really need to move away from very in reductionist approaches um, to really better understand how things are scaled and to think about the scaling systems and not just the interventions that are being scaled. So just finally, um, and I, t I take your point to heart that perhaps we should just move on from the SDGs now and start thinking about what SDG 2.0 looks like. But just very briefly, some of the research I've been doing um, in Canada was to really try to understand the uptake and scaling of policies like the SDGs by our federal government. So through some funding uh, from SHRC, we've been kind of looking at the different contextual factors. And you're absolutely right, actually, the, uh, the results that we're finding are really suggesting that the SDGs have been sidelined to some extent, right? And we know some of the reasons why, but empirically we've been able to demonstrate that. And this is despite an auditor um, general report that was done and a creation of a central coordinating unit. But we've had, and for those who are in Canada, um, most of the time, we've had three general elections during the past six years, and those electoral cycles have really upset the apple cart when it comes to policy uh, traction. And the other is that the pandemic, to some extent, has helped to raise awareness of inequities we found, but all, and also heighten the symbolic value of SDGs. But um, it, many of the public funds are being shifted away from SDG actions towards pandemic recovery, as we would understand. And so the potential of the SDG agenda is not necessarily being seen in the same way. And I, I will just conclude um, by saying that I think part of the elephant in the room is that we continue to operate within very vertical systems and we do not facilitate intersectoral action and that's really the kinds of interventions that we really need to be implementing that cut across health, society, uh, social and economic systems, but that's not easily done and that becomes much more difficult in a country like ours. So I'll just stop there and wanna really thank you for your very provocative comments and hopefully I've raised some more questions about things we really need to consider when we're thinking about measuring equity or inequities. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let me start by saying how uh, delighted I am to have this opportunity to engage um, uh, in this conversation and uh, with Erica and Zofie, who are leading voices for the SDGs. And thank you for your presentation, Dr. Buta. I thank you. Uh, I really appreciated the reflections you shared on the ways we can um, bridge the equity gap on maternal and child health. And there are important points that have emerged from your conversation, uh, your presentation, and I, and I hope we'll be able to like, um, engage in, in a conversation and um, unpack some of the brilliant insights you've shared. So one of the key things that I take away from your talk is that inequalities or uh, inequities between and within countries are persisting and have in fact been exacerbated by the pandemic. And you shared with us uh, compellingly the issue of measuring inequalities and the emerging approaches to overcome these issues. Um, and I also take for your, from your talk the, the importance of rethinking uh, how we measure inequities by recognizing that um, that inequities are defined by linkages um, with poverty and discrimination systems that uh, impact marginalized communities. So I think there is definitely a need to 
consider uh, systems of oppression such as racism, colonialism, when it comes to defining inequities. And, and, and I hope we'll be able to have a, a conversation on that and particularly on the quantitative measures um, to measure those kinds of systems of oppression that impact marginalized communities. I think when it comes to measuring inequities, we, we use proxies in terms of looking at a dimension of inequality. So we focus a lot on economic disparities uh, and you raise the point about looking at other axes or like dimension of inequality such as ethnicity. And I think it will be uh, important to consider as well other axes and dimension of inequality such as disability, uh, migratory status, uh, gender, sex, and I hope we can have um, a discussion on that and see how um, those um, dimensions of inequalities have been considered in, in global health research and how we can do better in terms of measuring those concepts. Um, the, the other thing that I, that I took away from your presentation is that um, we, we do need, we, well, we know how critical data is to characterize health vulnerabilities and risk and, and monitoring equitable progress um, towards our maternal and child health targets. And we cannot talk about uh, equity and reaching the hardest to reach when we don't actually have adequate data that provide a nuanced and comprehensive picture of maternal and child health in relation to the social determinants of health. Um, and, I, and I think one, I mean, one thing that I would uh, like to, um, for us to have a discussion about to, or to think about is um, the fact that data collection, particularly on maternal and child health survival, is, is challenged by suboptimal uh, civil registration, vital statistics, and health information systems. And, and right now, the status of the system is that they provide incomplete, uh, untimely, unreliable data to, um, to inform progress on maternal and child health. And these systems are also quite um, influenced um, or likely to be influenced by external shocks such as, uh, such as armed conflicts. And you made a point about community health workers being involved in delivering um, health, critical health interventions. And I think it will be the community health workers also, uh, given their position within the community, offer, um, have like a unique, hold a unique position to collect data not only on the health outcomes, but also on the social determinants of health. And I, and I hope that we can have a discussion on that, on how we can uh, collect um, data that is reflective, that is disaggregated, that is nuanced, that is comprehensive enough, and to, to share insights on, on which groups we're reaching and which group we're failing to reach. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of equity is that uh, equity is important to consider when it comes to data, when it comes to who's track who's re who are we reaching when we talk about the SDGs. I think equity within partnerships are also critical. And I think that's something we're seeing more and more when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and making sure that the perspective of, of various actors are reflected, particularly when it comes to like actors and stakeholders from low and middle income countries. So I think those are things that we, we need to, to think about ways to meaningfully and, and effectively engage communities, um, particularly diverse opinions within the communities uh, so that we can achieve equity in maternal and child health. And the last point that I will talk about is more in terms of, um, so what, one thing that, that really resonated with me was, um, well, we need the right kind of data, but we also need to conduct the right kind of research. And we need to have a better sense of like, what are the interventions that work for certain population and why? 
and, and I think that to me leads to the question of implementation sciences and incorporating those frameworks, those theories into um, the work that we do. So, uh, and I, so implementation sciences offer great, a great opportunity to, through integrating metrics and measures to, in order to evaluate successful interventions and particularly how those interventions are reaching marginalized communities. So I think what came up from, like, what resonated with me was um, the need to look at um, the success of the intervention, what explained the success of intervention, but also uh, look at the other side of, of the coin and look at why certain interventions are not working and um, perhaps have a, also a dialogue on the implementation of intervention that are not successful or not acceptable or not in, uh, effective for a particular population. So, so I, I, I definitely think that global health can benefit from looking, integrating more implementation science uh, framework. So I, those are the uh, ins, um, reflections that I wanted to share uh, following your, your presentation. Thank you so much, it was very insightful and, and I hope we can engage more in a, in a conversation because I have a lot of more questions than answer as a student. Thank you. hear me? Okay. Um, so we um, have time for questions, so now I'm switching hats. I'm your moderator. <laughs> and uh, so um, I'd like to uh, maybe just go to a couple of questions um, online and then um, come back to the audience. And I see Joe has his eager hand up and then Shellen. So I'll come back to both of you in a moment. Um, so we have a question online. So going forward and looking beyond 2030, do we need to revise or replace the SDGs? And if so, how? And so maybe this will be spoiler alert from tomorrow's presentation on your, uh, I have thoughts on that, but go ahead. <laughs> so pe people have uh, already begun to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you look at some of the investment frameworks that go beyond 2030, uh, there are already uh, models that have looked at trajectories based on the interruption and where people will go. Uh, and most of this work, uh, Erica, I think will happen at country level. Mm -hmm. So I don't think at the global level we're going to see any change anytime soon because the whole process is a juggernaut, you know, to bring it now together to say, let's set up targets for 2040. <laughs> it's going to be very challenging. But I think at country level, where all the SDGs are nested, and because it's relative change over time for in national targets, planning commissions need to start looking at where can they go, how do they want to go, and, and also, frankly, accept the fact that not all parts of the country are going to reach mm -hmm. a particular stage uh, at the same time. And there's no harm in recognizing that, as long as you're able to fix those strategies and disparities. A little bit like the example that I gave from KPK, there was nothing wrong with building a health insurance program around catastrophic um, uh, expenditures and illnesses. But what needed to happen was, and still needs to happen, is that you modify your strategy a year or two into the exercise to say, what do we need to do to fix it? Rather than suddenly discover five years down the road that you actually created greater uh, gaps and disparities between the public and private sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe I can just add, I think the other th opportunity we have is, yeah, last I remember, we created 169 targets and 230 indicators for the current SDG, so it's not a shortage of ways to measure things, and even high-income countries were drowning in the number of possible indicators. I think we could do better there in being less is more and also much more relevant and appropriate indicators that are uh, more suitable at the country level. So I'm gonna go to the audience, so in person, then I'll come back to um, the uh, questions online. So Joe. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, really terrific talk, Zulfi, and uh, terrific commentary as well from Miriam and Erica. And I want to just offer some reactions with a question, uh, but from, the, from uh, the perspective of a political scientist and a political economist, and we've had lots of opportunities to chat before, and uh, Stan and I have worked together before, and 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 you know there's a deep um, there's a deep resonance uh, in terms of the, the the perspectives that we might bring to this. So the first is is that your insight around um, the disaggregation and Tony Lake's um, quote, which is offsided, which I think is terrific, is I think spot on. And there's a great deal of political science work that's looking at subnational variation. Uh, in these outcomes. One of my former doctoral students done a terrific study on maternal child health outcomes in Chile in looking at regional uh, variations, subnational regional variations, and has found that, you know, in fact, um, whereas in the aggregate you may see an improvement, uh, when you disaggregate, 41% of subnational units are actually getting worse, right? So I think it, it speaks to exactly the kind of insight that you're bringing. And you know, there are many political scientists who have also tried to then investigate, well, why? What are some of the causal reasons uh, that we see this? And some really terrific work on Brazil looking at conditional cash transfers in Bolsa Familia. Uh, Wendy Hunter um, has done some great work in looking at, for instance, community level engagement and essentially coding those communities or municipalities of which there are over 5,000 and looking at those in which the um, community committees meet at least twice per month, just as a proxy of engagement. Very robust uh, findings with respect to then uh, take up rates as well as um, um, uh, reach rates uh, on Bosa Familia. The, the point you raise also about um, ethnicity and racism and that others have raised as well in, in the context of armed conflict or ethnically divided societies and the point that you raise about those in which there is a dominant ethnic group. I mean, from a political science point of view, it's very intuitive. Um, we know that these are, uh, these are uh, very real political problems. And one of the challenges then, um, and you know, is one of the challenges you raise, I think, is that a, a lot of what we're talking about here uh, are people and communities who are beyond the administrative reach or the, you know, beyond the administrative technologies of, of the state, if you will, right? There's a kind of almost illegibility. And there's a terrific political scientist, a giant in my field, James Scott, who wrote this great book called Seeing Like a State. And it was all about legibility. Uh, but his thesis was that there are populations that seek to remain illegible, that they remain to seek invisible to the state precisely for uh, the um, reasons that you intimated around uh, ethnic repression and suppression. And therefore, the purposes of surviving, they actually need to stay outside and beyond the reach of the state. And that, I think, poses a really interesting political problem uh, as we look to improve the administrative capacities of both states and markets in reaching those um, that you've identified. I love the tension, I love the point that you brought up about targeting at scale. Because I think in some ways, and maybe it's again the economist in me, it's really almost an oxymoron. When we think about scale, we think about replicability. It's almost the opposite of targeting, right? When you're talking about targeting, you're really talking about precision and thinking more locally, more contextually. And I think that, that just speaks to uh, a really important tension in how we think about this. And this is something I've been thinking a lot about. How do you target with precision at scale without relying on the economies of scale to be generated through replicability? Which leads me to my last point and really a question, and we've talked a little bit about this. And you know that we've done some work on this that the marginal cost increases in increasing coverage after usually around 50, 60% coverage begins to rise, not quite exponentially, but it certainly begins to rise at a much more steep curve, which makes it really problematic to get from coverage of 50% plus one of the marginal cost to reach that plus one is 2x over average. Or, as is the case in a piece we published, by the time you reach 100%, it's 4x over the average cost. That's really 
difficult uh, to justify in terms of public policy or in terms of market logic. I would, so I would love to work with, because I know you're thinking about this, and I know you've got some real tremendous access to data. Can, is, does this data exist where we can actually track the marginal cost at that granular level, and can we bring that together and think about how we might be able to, uh, to write some papers on that? In fact, I know you're really busy. I'm really busy. Can we just sit down for like an hour sometime? You bring your team, I'll bring my team, and let's just come out with three papers that we want to write together. So, Thanks. So any, any thoughts on that, Sufi? Big question. Uh, so <clears throat> we could easily spend an hour discussing this because these are all such rich comments. Uh, but let me reflect on where I'm coming from on this. So the ground reality in public health is that we're not going to get from A to Z in one go. Uh, but the whole point of my underscoring some of these things, Joe, is that uh, if you don't bring them up, if you don't make them part of the discussion, dialogue, planning process, the pros and cons analysis, they'll never get done. Now when, uh, uh, so let me start with, before I move to my own geography, by telling you how political decision making is done. And how sometimes difficult decisions are done if you take people along and are transparent. And I take the example of the fall of the Berlin Wall. When Germany united, the discrepancy, the disparity between East Germany and West Germany was phenomenal. In many things, including science and technology, in health and in education, you were looking at East Germany being at least two decades behind. Systems didn't exist. Data did not exist. They were strong in one element. They were very poor in others. A cautious decision was made by the political parties by most importantly the leadership in Germany, that they were going to bring East Germany at par. And they would pay the cost for that, that everybody would understand, recognize, and sign up on. And it would take 15 years, but 15 years on, they would have equity across the entire nation. I think that's one of the most important and phenomenal examples of how collective, informed decision-making can bring people up from a very low base to an equitable status before long. Now, what I'm talking about in low- and middle-income countries is not too different. For example, my group did the National Nutrition Survey in 2018 of the entire country with district-level power. You know, that generally is not done. This is a survey at scale, took us four or five years, $10 million to do, the whole point in doing that at district level was that we would then be able to offer solutions that were district specific. And that this whole cluster of 30 districts in the south of the country that were so far behind the rest would require greater level of investment, would require greater attention, human resource, commodities, poverty alleviation strategies to bring them up at par and not just periodically for the media to raise the issue of Tharparkar or other districts being so far behind. Um, I learned a big lesson in that, is that you know, science only drives policy to a certain extent, and you need to also have taken a degree in political science, which I hadn't taken. <laughs> the problem is when you go to legislators and you talk about some people giving up their share of the budget and others getting more than, mm. and, than the rest, then all science or evidence-based policy falls apart. And it just falls into the lap of the political leadership to do a Germany on Pakistan, which didn't happen. We tried uh, with the last government, and we succeeded to some extent to say, can you launch some specific programs, special programs in those districts? But I have no regrets. I think uh, highlighting those disparities, differences, contextual issues, and the marginal costs of doing so so as part of that exercise, we were also able to estimate how much additional money would be needed to make that happen. And the additional money was totally affordable within the system. It was completely affordable over a period of time within the grass, but it would need to be sold to the political leadership using some of the lessons from political economy and, and uh, decision making that I think public health professionals don't necessarily have always. So I'd love to join hands and talk a little bit about how we could have done it differently. <laughs>
Mariam, do you have anything to comment on? Okay. Um, yeah, I think those are great points, and I think I would just add really briefly that we all often add more programs, and we don't take ineffective programs out of the system, and they continue to consume resources and attention. And so we also have to be mindful of some of those trade-offs um, that occur. Um, Shaolin, I think, and then I'll come to you, if that's all right. John? Um, can you um, get the mic to, and then I'll, I'll come back. There's one question online, and then uh, Dr. Dirks, I'll come to you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, really wonderful talk and wonderful comments. I want to ask uh, two questions. One is quite simple, another maybe a little bit complicated. The simple question that uh, I think marrying the inequity is very important, but uh, normally it's very challenging in a developing world setting. So we are going to do a, a RCT in Pakistan, but finding marrying the income or the sets would be quite time consuming. So I wonder what would be your comments on that. My second question is regarding how to uh, take uh, the interventions and then uh, embed them into the health system, uh, then reach a much bigger population. Because I think that we are talking lots of kind of incremental improvement. For example, a little bit add-on, like cat transfers, like adding more kind of responsibilities for the other doctors or major health workers to do this, you know, certain interventions. But more importantly, as you rightly point out, we need to look beyond the wage health workers into the doctors, nurses, midwives. These kind of people, I think right now, they are widely available in the rural health units, rural health centers in Pakistan, but they are not functional. Uh, recent uh, studies found that only like 20% of the doctors in these uh, rural health centers could diagnose hypertension and diabetes. Uh, and uh, most of them do not have functional lab, et cetera. So I think the next step really to look at how to mobilize, uh, I think one, political science is very important. And secondly, how to strengthen the primary care delivery system in the country would be very important. I think that is also a, net, a challenge in most African countries because in many countries, prime care does not exist. And how we could move on to this part will be really kind of change of equity and the health care outcomes. Thank you. Sufi, do you want to comment or Mariam? Go ahead. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Please. Um, do you want to put the microphone in front oh. of you? Yeah, sorry. Um, Thank you, Professor, for your, for your question. I think, I mean, the point that I wanted to re react on is, is um, the point you made about um, integrating intervention in the health system. And I, and I um, through my very basic understanding of implementation, basic understanding and exposure to implementation science, I think this field does provide opportunity to really look into the barriers of facilitators uh, when it comes to uh, implementing those interventions. And I think that as researchers, uh, we have sort of like a duty to really reflect on those facilitators and barriers and making those obvious and transparent to policymakers. And I think those are ways that we can ensure that um, intervention that we, found, we find effective are actually integrated into the health system. So that's the point that I wanted to react on, and I'll leave, I'll let Zolfi and Erika provide more insights. So I'd love to have a side conversation before you go to Pakistan and, <laughs> and tell you a little bit about uh, how I think you might be able to succeed. There are several things going in your favor. Firstly, you're going to probably the best province. You're going to Punjab. You're going to a province where the health minister, who is a, is, is a friend of mine, and we train together, is uh, an obstetrician uh, and believes in evidence. That's generally not a luxury no. that many people have. If you have a current federal health minister mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, let me not say any more in public, actually, <laughs> all right? Um, the third is that I think you have money. <laughs> 
Pakistan has just signed a $400 million GFF accord. So there will be money in the health system to do exactly what you're trying to do is to expand the disease control priorities uh, envelope and bring NCDs into primary care settings, including rural health centers. So your approach is absolutely right at the right time. And that hopefully we put aside the Punjab government's um, plans, uh, lopsided as they were three years ago, to do away with community health workers. So I think a lot is going for you. Now, the big challenge that's going to be uh, there is that you will have mixed health systems. There are people who are public till 2 o'clock in the afternoon and private after that. And when you have districts where you have functional uh, facilities in the private care settings, radiology, ultrasounds work, and they don't work in the public sector, that balance in terms of provision of services, particularly with a health insurance scheme that generally is now blind to whether you seek it in the private sector or the public sector, that's the balance we need to have. And the second thing, which I come back to your comment, which I agree with absolutely, is that measurement is now increasingly possible within district health information systems. Because district health information systems, particularly DHIS2, uh, which the government has owned up to, does have tremendous potential for getting its act together, becoming more inclusive, becoming more transparent, becoming much more uh, uh, legit. And therefore, you don't have to spend that extra money that you would otherwise have to set up a parallel measuring system. So if you were able to speak to Yasmin, and I'd be happy to facilitate a dialogue to say, we will do this if you do this, and work together a, a project at reasonable scale where the government could be informed itself as to what happens. And I'll close by saying that the fortunate thing is that the prime minister right now is the former chief minister of Punjab, who was the de facto health minister for almost 15 years. And the one thing that Shehbaz Sharif did well every day without fail was to assemble his health team at 7 o'clock in the morning. They hated his guts, but they all came. <laughs> Why? Because he was singularly focused on improving health equity in Punjab. He didn't know a thing about equity, but he knew that he had to do it at scale, and therefore for immunizations and for dengue control in Pakistan, if there is any person that can be credited, is Shabazz Sharif, and his projects and programs are all focused on data. He wanted real-life data coming through the public sector systems from their own information outlets and not through service. And that was the secret of his success. Leadership matters <laughs> at the right time. Um, Dr. Turks, go ahead. Um, microphone, please. <laughs> Sophie, I, uh, I would like to ask you two questions. The first, when I first met you in, at AQU in Karachi 27 years ago, I was sent to different places. So one was the Kachia bodies or the ghetto areas of Pakistan, or Karachi, and the other one uh, uh, was to go into the mountains to see what uh, the Arkha University had, or the development agency had done. Uh, sufficient to say, in the, even those mountains where you'd land, uh, the communities had been built. So there was health care, there was education, child and maternal mortality declined, girls went to school, went to high school and, and developed uh, trades and professions. But in Karachi, it was interesting too because there were Karachi bodies like the one led by Akhtar Hamid Khan in Orangi, where he built sewers, health units, brick uh, concrete houses and so on. And you go, and, and, the, and I don't know what the parameters were, you can tell me in terms of improvement, but next time there were a few others that were like that. So leadership was very critical. Three years ago, I was in India for the, the child charity Children Believe. And I went into many Dalit villages and also some in large cities like Chennai. And again, this was the result of building a community. The community gathering was mostly women, 95%. A few men stood at the back because most of the men were working somewhere else. 
again, it was very powerful to see how this had, how, how powerful this was and how ambitious this community was, whereas before it had been totally neglected. Uh, again, uh, I discussed this then with a recent Secretary of India of Health, and he poo-pooed it a bit because he said there, uh, the men still brought too much alcohol and violence into these vi villages. But it's again, again it's an issue too that we face in Canada and some of our communities. So the question how to strengthen communities and build them one by one, it, these things can't be done easily on a large scale when you're dealing with multi-millions. So my second question relates to SDG, and I guess the, the apparent now that the uh, achievement of the goals will probably not be realized and take a longer period of time. I read an interesting opinion the other day that said, as a result of severe uh, episodes in climate change, heat, drought, uh, the new war in Ukraine, uh, clashes elsewhere, it's time to focus more on dealing with the insults that occur. Uh, and we, we, as Canadians, we realize even the recent fires, the long drought in British Columbia, even Canadians are poor at this in terms of manning the, the necessary help, the skills that are needed to deal with this quickly. And of course, in many countries, many children die as a result of this. So these are complex issues. I'd welcome your opinions. So, so John, for every complex question, there is a simple answer, and more <laughs> often than not, it's wrong. So I, I, I'll try and tackle the first one, which pertains to community development. And there, I am reasonably clear in my mind that uh, there are some levers that will accelerate community development and engagement. And those levers are more often than not women, and more often than not tackling gender inequity, straight on, earlier on. And the strongest lever that I've seen in influencing development, and particularly health, is education. I come from the Northwest Frontier, the, uh, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan, which you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when I was growing up there, was probably the most backward, poor province in the country. Half the population or more were tribal areas. Deep-rooted feudalism with land ownership in the hands of a relative few. I have seen in my own lifetime, th partly through a political process, but also through a process of social rebellion coming from the grassroots, you call that militancy or whatever, the entire social fabric and the disparities in that province reduce change and disappear. So today, it's one of the more egalitarian provinces, maybe not by design, but by default and change over time. It also happens to be the province that has made the maximum gains in health, nutrition, and education, and women's empowerment in a society which was really, um, uh, you know, uh, misogynistic, to say the least. So change comes over time. I'm not saying that they've got it all right, but I'm saying they have the best indicators and they have the most forward-looking health minister, Opel happens to be the finance minister, and he's just put $1 billion into health last year. There's not a single province in the country that's put a billion dollars in health in a low middle-income country. So I think change can happen over time. And he put money into health, Temur, he told me, not because he thought it was right, because that's what he was hearing from the grassroots, mm -hmm. from all of these communities, districts, et cetera. That's where people were. Uh, the second question is a bit more complicated uh, around the whole balance between the sustainable development goals. There are 17 goals. Not all goals are created equal. Thank God that they had 17 goals and not just one goal on health, goal three. I, as I mentioned, I think some of the most important goals in these SDGs are outside of health. So I happen to believe that the gender equality, the inequity reduction goal is a very important one, but so is climate change. You can't go to many countries, in Canada in particular, but also to, to my country of origin, Pakistan today, and talk to people about development and the future and well-being without people asking, okay, so what, what is the relationship of climate change with this? 
when you have a third of the country drown virtually, landmass, 34 million people displaced, and in a situation where the cost of the current floods is $40 billion, then they will take over the SDG discussion by default. So I do believe that in moving forward, if we go beyond the 2030 targets, which we have to, that we need to look at repackaging the SDGs in some ways to prioritize some subsets of the SDGs more than others. As, as you know, some of the sustainable development goals are not even measurable at the moment yeah. because we don't have measures. But for climate change, there is tremendous progress in terms of how we look at it through on the ground measurement as well as remote sensing, and also how we begin to look at both community resilience, uh, adaptation, and global mitigation strategies. Yeah, I think those are excellent points. And um, I would just add, and then we'll close, is that I think, again, we're still caught up in vertical programming, as uh, many countries, and that actually plays against working intersectorally. And we do need programs that are not just designed for health or for gender equality, but also programs that look at the intersections. Uh, because that's how societies work or don't work. And, uh, but that requires, I think, um, we're, we have a bit of a crisis of imagination, and I really agree with you around climate change in that it's forced because it, it, it really touches on all sectors of society. It has forced that conversation, and the urgency of the problem has forced that conversation. So on behalf of all of you, and I apologize for those of you online that we couldn't get to all your questions, I just want to first of all thank uh, Dr. Bhutta for a very thought-provoking presentation and your amazing reflections, and Miriam as well for your commentary. I'll thank myself. Um, and I will thank all of you and all of you um, online for joining. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dirk, for also for creating this opportunity to honor people like Sufi who have tremendously influenced many of us um, within and outside this room. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. And without further ado, this brings a close to this event. There is food outside. And please mingle. Um, but I think uh, we have some closing remarks from our colleague from Gartner. Thanks. Hello. I'm Summer Wedlock. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Gartner Foundation. And I extend my thanks to everyone who's joined us here in person and those virtually. My thanks to our, our distinguished speakers. Um, very insightful and really interesting presentations and, and comments. I'd like to thank our presenting po uh, partner, Dylana School of Public Health and the University of Toronto, and our presenting sponsor, who is TELUS Health. Um, so the Global Perspective panels were developed in the spring of 2022. Really, um, we realized as the Gardner Foundation our moral obligation to provide Canadians with information they could use to understand the global pandemic. It has now evolved into an annual series that provides fact-based science information on various topics. Today's speakers have given us a lot to think about, and I do hope that you'll join us in the reception afterwards. This event is part of Gardner Science Week. So tomorrow you can hear from Dr. Buddha again alongside um, his, the rest of our 2022 laureates uh, in the Mars Auditorium. So please, I hope that you'll join us. And you can also uh, find out more information about Gardner on our website, gardner.org, or follow us on social media at Gardner Awards. Uh, thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>